Okay, hello. Um, uh, I'm here with Stephen Mather today. Hi, Stephen. Hello, good morning. So uh, Stephen, in uh, his madness, has agreed to let me interview him and ask a few probing questions just to learn a little bit about his business. And then later in the session, um, he's going to uh, share some uh, tips that we're going to look at terms and conditions. Is that right, Stephen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, slightly different angle on it, why you don't need terms and conditions. Okay, that's fine. That's I'm fine with that. So for those of those of us, those of you, I can't even speak today. For job, those, this is a live call. I know. Thank God <laughs> no one's watching. Oh, someone is watching. I apologise. Okay. Um, so for those of you that don't know you, do you just want to introduce yourself and let the world know who you are? Sure. So my name's Stephen Mather. I'm a solicitor. I've been a solicitor since 2008. Um, in private practice, I was at a couple of firms before, most recently um, an award-winning firm in Leicestershire where I was partner for, for nine years. In January of this year, 2020, I, I left there to set up uh, effectively on my own. So I'm a consultant solicitor for a number of different law firms now, and I have my own clients as well. And, um, and I've always set out to be um, a, a lawyer for businesses. So uh, over the last uh, 10, 12 years, what I've really focused on is disputes and helping people in court battles and things like that. Um, and now uh, setting up on my own, I've done something a little bit different, which is you know, just a, a more general help to small businesses, um, small and medium sized businesses, my key clients. Okay, great. So what had you choose the legal profession way back when? How did I choose the legal profession? So, yeah. um, so, so the, the basics of it is I, I, I pretty much failed maths at A level. <laughs> and, and so, so at, at that time, I was, uh, I'm, I'm a geek at heart. I was into computers. I had a, had a business. I, I had a, my first website, in actual fact, was before Google. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had a business doing websites and website designs um, for, for people. And I was doing computers. I was going to do computer science. So I did A level maths. And it was, quite frankly, the hardest thing that ever I've ever done in my life. It was a completely different language. It was worse than learning Mandarin or anything like that. It's completely off the scale. I remember going to pick up my exam results. Um, I got an E, right? Just barely passed, but barely got a grade. I went to the, t they saw the teacher and the teacher said, oh, Stephen, I'm so, so pleased you've done so well. And I said, miss, I, I got an E. She went, yeah, I know. I didn't expect you to do so well. <laughs> and, um, so thanks, for you. <laughs> thanks very much and um so so i had to drop uh math i wasn't going to do it in the second second year of a levels and so i had to pick another, another subject and i think the choice was something like media studies psychology and law um so i thought oh i'll do law i remember the teacher saying um you know it, it, it's it's a hard subject you know you'll hit the ground running and there's a lot to do i remember my reply to the guy was um, when he said, it's you, you'll hit the ground running, I said, because this is me and I'm an idiot, I said, don't worry, I've got running shoes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then it turns out that actually it was really enjoyable and I quite liked it. I got 100% in the first exam, which was you know, sort of the top score in the country, as you might imagine, no one really gets more than 100% in exams. 100% um, in the first exam. And at that point, I was like, actually, I quite, quite like this. I've really enjoyed learning about law. I'd already subscribed to doing um, computer science at university. Um, and so I spoke to them and said, you know, actually, I, I really enjoy law. Um, this is what I'm predicted to get uh, on my AS level. Um, you know, do you want to take me on? And they said, yeah. And, and the rest, as they say, is, is history. OK, so you said you used to work for uh, quite a reasonable sized legal practice before you became a uh, uh, solopreneur, if that's the right word. So what had you uh, make that make that step from, I guess, what, what uh, you know, I guess most people before they go into small business on their own, um, uh, you know, see, see working for a company is more comfortable and less risky. So what had you make that 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 leap, if you like? Pretty much being a terrible employee. Um, <laughs> so, so um, I, I've always, as I say, from from um, from a young age, my, my family have always been self-employed, running businesses. So I've always had that uh, that within me. So even at you know at, in in the school playground, for instance, I was um, selling sweets uh, at break times. You know, um, I was doing the, the, effectively running a tuck shop um, out of my sports bag. 
Um, moving on to then A levels, I was running um, a website design business. I've, I've had uh, a few different businesses that I've I've ran as well. So I've done letting agency. I've done a um, uh, we bought a, um, a mobility scooter and um, devices shop, and I ran that for a while. And so that kind of that entrepreneur was always within me and inside me. Being a lawyer, um, that that helps because I understand how business works, understand how the clients work. But being a lawyer in a traditional partnership doesn't work with the entrepreneur type ethic. Um, and that's uh, and, and that's where the kind of the, the decision to really set up my own um, stems from, because it got to a point I, I, I was in there for a long time, um, expecting uh, effectively to, um, to, to, to to be, you know, the top guy and run it. But in a partnership, it doesn't happen because all the partners are making decisions. You have all the partners there and and everybody has a say. Mm. In things. And um and while I can, I, I did that, and I did it for nine years. Actually, when, when it comes down to it, I want to be able to do what I want to do, how I want to do it. If I want to have Friday afternoon off, I, I, I'm going to do that. If I want to, you know, work all day on Tuesday and work, you know, 15 hour days, I can do that. Um, and it's about having that freedom, that flexibility um, to do what I want. The, the second second point is, I, I didn't just want to be a lawyer. Um, and being a p- partner in a law firm meant that all I was doing was law, you know, and it was really seven days a week managing a law firm. We turned over quite a lot of, uh, of work and a lot of um, and had a lot of employees. It's a big organisation. And so the whole week, including Saturday, Sundays, was taken up by that. So I wanted to step away from that, reduce my hours down in law, as, a, as it were, and then be able to kind of get back into the the business world of it and, and run and explore other business interests and opportunities that I've, I've got as well. Did, did you see it as a risk going, you know, because I think you've got a young family, so, you know, you've got to put sort of uh, uh, bread on the table, as it were. So, you know, when you go into the, the, the small business world, you know, you're on your own effectively, you've got to get generate your own business. Did you see it as a, as a risk for you or how did you perceive it? <sighs> So, so the, the honest, truthful answer to that is, um, is that I'm a man of faith. And so I knew and, and, and really firmly believed that I would be okay because I'd be provided for. That's mm-hmm. a probably a little bit deep and, and, you know, somewhere that maybe wouldn't necessarily say all the time in a business networking mm-hmm. meeting or anything like that. The reality of it is, of course, I'm human. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at it going, well, contractually, I'm not allowed to take any clients. I'm not allowed mm-hmm. to contact any clients. Mm. that I've had for the last two years or something mm. like that. Um, I'm, I'm not allowed to make any any contact with any of those. So I'm starting from scratch. So come January the 24th, I think it was, I had zero work, zero clients. Um, and and so, yes, you know, practically speaking, there was certainly, uh, certainly a risk. I guess it was a little bit different for me in setting up a business because I've been doing it for 12 years, longer. I've been in the industry for, you know, 14, 15 years that I've got enough of a reputation, enough people know me, a, 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 a you know, big enough network that actually, you know, going and, and, and leaving and setting up my own, um, I, I, it wasn't as if I just starting from scratch and, you know, coming out of university day one. Mm. And then uh, just to sort of scupper things which happened to some businesses, you started about two or three months before a little bug came along. Um, yeah. And Kai Bosch on a lot of things. Did, did that have any impact on you? Did that worry you, given that, you know, you'd recently started a business? Um, no, again, for, for similar reasons. Um, but if, if anything, it, it, it kind of re-solidified my, the, the, the way I was proposing to work. So uh, in, in leaving, I wanted to leave behind the, the old-fashioned way of lawyers working, the traditional partnership model, the high street firm, the, the, the working on an hourly rate basis, all of those things that um, that solicitors get, uh, you know, sort of criticised for. I wanted to, to scrap all of that and, and kind of start from, again, start from a blank slate. So I do things differently. So I, I was always intending to do, you know, virtual meetings, phone, to, you know, video call meetings anyway, because it saves you traveling or it saves me traveling and there's cost attached to that and environmental issues um working completely digitally um we have a complete transparency on fees so that you only get charged what you agree that you're going to you pay and you'll pay that and you know you're going to pay and you're not going to get any surprise bills um so so i i was already planning to work like that anyway the the coronavirus the impact on that sure like everybody had 
um, some impact when it first hit in March. You know, everything went a little bit quiet. But actually, the clients that I've got now um, are, they seem to be taking it as an opportunity more than anything else um, and seeing it as an opportunity rather than a threat. So I've got a lot of people that are buying businesses, for instance, they're entering into contracts, they're, they're doing stuff um, that need legal support as a result of the coronavirus and not, uh, not in, uh, because of it. Well, you, I think you certainly hit the ground running because you seem to make quite an impact quite quickly. You know, your website was there, um, uh, your branding was there, um, uh, you started creating some legal guides. So you'd, you'd obviously thought it thought it out quite quite well. And um, so, six so notice period. <laughs> yeah, well, I had, I had a six month notice period. So, 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 so I could I could in theory do some of that. At, you know, at night time reducing down the amount of work that I was doing in terms of management um, yeah. in that period. I could do some of my own stuff. I did a lot of it over the Christmas period, knowing that I was uh, over that Christmas period, um, 19, uh, you know, uh, last year, um, I, I worked a, a huge amount, um, you know, actually putting in some real long hours, writing all the content for the website, building the website, doing all the brand. I did all of that myself as well. Um, and like you say, made, made, an, made a, uh, an impact. The, um, the the news story that I put up when I, when I first left announcing my my departure um, across all social media platforms had something like twenty five thousand views. Wow. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So I sometimes ask people, um, and we've probably touched a little bit on this in terms of your story so far. You know, what's your why? You know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What drives you to um, do what you do? So, what would you say your why is? Um, so I, I actually I spent a bit of time on this. I went on a, a Simon Sinek course um, mm -hmm. to try and get to uh, to try and work out what that was. I always I always thought it was um, about winning and, mm -hmm. and helping clients win. But actually, um, I, I like winning. But actually, what I, I prefer is just getting the, the right result, the best result for the client. That's not necessarily winning, and most of the time, actually, it's not winning. It's it's about trying to you know um, get the best result, settle the matter. Um, but what I've realized is my, my why actually is to, to, is to, uh, to, to create a happy and supporting environment, legal environment, so that everybody involved gets a better night's sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that sounds a little bit strange for a lawyer, a lawyer's why, um, but actually it really works for me because litigate, um, you know, particularly litigation, any legal services really, it's quite stressful for the client. I see lots of people that come to me and it's, a massive problem for them. It's something that's really stressful and it's something that keeps them up at night. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can then take away some of that pressure, take away some of those issues and, and genuinely help them sleep a little bit better at night because they don't need to worry about it anymore. I've sorted it for them or I've, you know, we've settled with one or whatever it is. Um, that's, that's really what gives me my kicks. And, and that's what I've realized when the clients give me that feedback. And I had it a number of times now where they've said, um, you know, it's keeping me up at night, I'm not sleeping. And then after they've spoken to me, they say, I think I'll sleep a bit better tonight, Stephen. Thanks very much. Right. That really kind of gives me that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that makes me go, yeah, that's why I'm doing the job. That's why I do what I do. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. Absolutely. Um, and again, we might have touched on this before. What would you say makes you different from your, your competitors? Um, this one's always a hard one to answer without sounding incredibly arrogant. And anybody that knows me um, will hopefully realise that I'm not incredibly arrogant. Um, uh, but but there's, a, there's a fine line between arrogance and someone with my sense of humour. Um, but the, 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 the real difference between me and my competitors is, is me and, and, and my approach to, uh, to, to providing the legal services and, and life generally. So... Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm happy. I know I don't look happy. And, and sometimes my droll, dry sense of humour might not come across like I'm happy. But I'm happy and I want the clients to be happy. Yeah. So I want clients to come to me and, and actually enjoy working with me and vice versa. I want to enjoy working with them. Yeah. Um, as, as I said before, um, what makes me different as well is the delivery of the services. So we do things in a digital way. So everything's digitally uh, done. We sign contracts digitally. Everything's on email. You know, all all in the cloud. Um, can work wherever. So you know, that's something that lawyers don't do. Um, walking away from the traditional billing method of a lawyer as well. 
is, is a difficult one, and um, but it's 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 working. And um, as a, a two two calls yesterday, one one in particular that stands out's worth mentioning. The clients, I'd, I'd given them a price, and then the client said, "Well, what are you know? But, uh, will there be any other costs? You know, what what else will there be? No, you know, that's that's the price. You you pay that price, and that's it." Mm. Um, and 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 they were like, "Well, you know, what if you do?" X, Y, and Z. Well, if we if I do do X, Y, and Z, then we'll agree a further price, and you'll know exactly what it is before you you, you pay it. There won't be any surprise bills. And and of course, the, the number one complaint against solicitors is the surprise bills. They get you know people get a big bill at the end of it because the, the solicitor has gone. Well, it took longer than I thought. You know, it's now taking me three, four, five, six, ten hours, twelve hours, whatever. Here's a bill. It's two thousand pounds, and and it's a lot more than. Um, what the client thought it was going to be. So I think probably the, the, the other thing that makes me different is the fact that I'll, I'll try and fix fees for anything. Yeah, I, th- I think m- most uh, small businesses and uh, I guess consumers like to know exactly what it's going to cost them with no sort of hidden extras, don't they? Um, so so um, given the current climate that we're in, um, ha- have you had to adapt in terms of how you've um, engage with clients because I guess the norm would be you know face to face meeting, have a chat over a cup of coffee. Um, uh, so how have you found that? Have you adapted? You know, have, have you had to do things differently to to get that engagement and get that 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 piece of business? Um, no, I've not I've not done anything differently because it was always my plan to do things um, you know kind of with, with less face to face contact, um, and it's something that I've been putting in action before leaving as well. And a lot of clients, because it's the traditional way of doing things, the traditional way of engaging a lawyer, they'd ring up and say, can I book an appointment to come and see you? And I would say, you know, well, why? You know, what, what, why do you want an appointment? What is it? Let's have a talk about it first. And, and usually then within a sort of a 10 or 15 minute um, conversation, I can, I, I know because I'm experienced enough, I know what we need to do, how it's going to work out, usually what the other side are probably going to say and come up with their arguments as well and can kind of roadmap out where this is going to go. And and then I've just saved the client that initial meeting. There might be some times where I need to review some documents or have a further conversation with them in a bit more detail to get to the, you know, to the, 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 um, uh, go through the subject matter. But more often than not, that sort of 10, 15 minutes of time at the, at the beginning is really helpful. It also sifts out the clients that then can't, afford it can't justify the costs of doing taking that action and you know what if i spend 10 15 minutes with somebody for free and don't charge them anything it's no you know no skin off my um my, no skin off my back um but actually so doing it that way uh, i found it's been really effective the second thing that i found really effective in helping clients to um to agree to use me has been actually the website and um so so my website is is all personal it's 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 about me um, and how I can help the clients and the benefits that they will get by using me has my story on there. And a lot of the clients I, I'm doing sort of the feedback surveys with clients and say, you know, why did you give me a call? So I ask, where did they get my number from? Most of the time it's from Google unless it's a referral. And then I say, oh, what, what made you choose me rather than anybody else? Mm-hmm. And, um, and more often than not, they say it's because you sound like the person that I want to, you know, on my side, you know, mm-hmm. you, you've got the experience. It sounds like you've got the experience. It sounds like you can help. And I like your style. Um, so actually the combination of the two has meant that in the pandemic, I've not needed to do those kind of face-to-face relationship building meetings, have a cup of tea and have a coffee because we're, we're, we're almost kind of, the clients are ringing me because they want to use me because they've seen, they've seen me on it. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it, it's it's about generating that that connection, that rapport, um, and being able to do it remotely. It sounds like you know what you've got on your website does um, uh, a pretty good job doing that in terms of you know engaging people, starting that journey. Um, but I think if you if you've gone in with the mindset of being virtual, that you've obviously set your business up that way, and it's it's definitely worked in in the, in the current climate, I guess, where. It, other businesses that aren't used to doing that have probably suffered a little bit. So outside, yeah, of- there, there, there may well be a change because it's this is all this is all I've known. There may well be a change when everything goes back to normal. There may yeah. well be a change again that actually people want to go and do those face to face meetings again. So it, it may well be that I have to revert back to those 
you know, more old fashioned ways because that's what client wants, clients want. But right now it seems to be working. Sorry yeah, it's inter interesting. interesting to see how it shapes up. So outside of the pandemic, which I guess has been a biggest challenge for most people, what, what so far has been the other biggest challenge that you face in your business? Um, biggest challenge. So, uh, well, obviously, look, I mean, starting a business is, is mm -hmm. effectively from scratch, as I say, no clients, no work, um, no ability to go and, and speak to those existing clients because I'd be sued for doing that. So, so everything was, you know, starting from scratch. And, um, and, and that's been the biggest challenge, really, which is, um, uh, if anything, the pandemic's helped because it's meant that people are looking at their screens a bit more. And I've made a real, you know, real effort over the last nine or 10 months to make sure that, you know, everyone knows about me um, mm -hmm. you know, locally, all of my contacts, all of my um, contacts is in non-client contacts, you know, my network, um, the referrers, et cetera, um, that everyone knows about me, friends, family, that they know about me, they can share it. So I, I, I think I've been reasonably active on, on social media, um, doing it, and then behind the scenes, making sure the website's working and, and, and ranking and doing the SEO and all of that kind of thing. So all of that really has been uh, been a challenge um, over this uh, over this period. It's uh, I've effectively I've had to establish a business in um, in, in really difficult times. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, it's, uh, it's 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 doing okay. But no doubt, Bourbon and Brie sales have gone up in this time. Definitely Bourbons. Oh, I love, <laughs> love a Bourbon. Um, Brie, yeah, I certainly, in, in lockdown, um, Bourbons and Brie, they were short on supply. Um, and uh, and so when when the online shops had them, it was like, right, order as many as you allow. <laughs> Brie, three packets of Bourbons. I've got a week to fill, not three days. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, I, 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 there was a point in time where I kind of, again, my humour um, wanted to kind of incorporate some of that into my uh, into my marketing, but uh, soundness got ahead of me and realised that I shouldn't just be known for eating brie and bourbon. <laughs> um, but suddenly, that's suddenly that's now stuck in everyone's mind. Sorry for bringing that up. So moving rapidly on. So um, you decided to uh, create a podcast. So tell us about your reason behind that and let people know how they can sort of access that. And um, yeah, just that really. So why did you yeah. start it up and what's it called and how do people find it? Perfect. So, so yes, it's called the, the Business Herald podcast. Um, it's available on uh, everywhere that you can get uh, a podcast from. It's also available on online at www businessherald.co.uk. Um, setting up a podcast and starting a podcast is something that I've wanted to do for, for quite a long time, probably more than a year, actually, um, of, of getting around to doing it. It wasn't something that quite fitted in with uh, with my previous practice. And, and then uh, as I was planning it, um, there's there's lots of, lots of law firms, the bigger ones, and barristers firms that do legal-based podcasts. And they're as boring as hell. And and so I was, I was, I knew that I didn't want to do a legal podcast. Also, I'm probably not clever enough to do a legal podcast talking about some of the, you know, the new changes in law or new case law or something along those lines. So that wasn't for me. Um, so I was trying to figure out how I could do a podcast to get further exposure to people and you know, expand the network um, and, and what I could do that on. And, and what I realized, I was, I was reading the business news stories every day. Um, so actually what I started doing is just writing those, you know, those headlines down. And I thought a um, couple of things. I've got a, a big mailing list of, uh, of, of people, contacts, et cetera. But again, emailing them just about some legal stuff was a little bit boring. So I thought if I could email them something that was useful, um, you know, so, so now we email people about the business news stories. And then on the podcast on a Friday, we talk about some of the main ones, how they will affect um, small and medium sized enterprises each week I've had a couple of guests on Paul you've been a guest and that was really good a really good show and you came on we'll get you back again a um, couple of guests on that are in the kind of the SME sector somebody that has uh, some, some something useful to add um, and then we just talk about the issues and, and really some of those issues you know they may or may not affect the small business owner but it, it really was a way of engaging um, a new audience or a different type of audience expanding my network expanding my uh, visibility while not just talking about law and boring stuff 
um, talking about something more interesting. And I, and I absolutely love it. I really, really love doing it. Um, I, I really enjoy, um, you know, the conversations that I'm having with people and meeting different people and new people and seeing their views and opinions on things. I love putting it together and doing the editing and then um, and then I do it on a Friday and, and pretty much by the time I've finished, I then knock off and uh, and call it a day. And, it, uh, and that's kind of, you know, great Friday finish at sort of three o'clock. Um, if I can at all possible, then it, it's brilliant. And so it, it then ticks all my boxes, which is, you know, working hard, doing well, but having time to enjoy other things, the podcast being other stuff, family and everything like that. It just means I'm a bit more rounded. Yeah, yeah. No, don't be put off, guys. He has had me on it, but he's had far more intelligent people on it as well. It's a, it's a good listen on a Friday afternoon. I, I quite like it on a Friday afternoon as well. It just sort of eases me into the weekend. It's sort of easy listening. So you kindly said you'd do a little education slot for us and share some of your um, uh, vast knowledge. So I'm going to just put you on uh, full screen now. And uh, yeah. if, if I can do that, so you're on full screen now. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Stephen. I think you're going to talk to us about terms and conditions. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks very much, Paul. Uh, so I've, I've, I've worded this, I've titled this, Why Your Business Doesn't Need Terms and Conditions. This is my, uh, my sense of humour more than anything else. So rather than telling people why they should have terms and conditions, um, I'll tell you why you, should, why you don't need it, you don't need to bother. Um, but firstly... Um, let's talk about what terms and conditions are and what a contract is. So terms and conditions are effectively a contract um, and they are the written form of the agreement between two or more parties. Um, so a verbal contract, you know, a, a gentleman's handshake is enforceable in law. If you have a dispute over it, completely enforceable, you can go to court over it. But it's he said, he said, she said. There's no written uh, agreement on what the agreed terms between the parties were. So we write things down, and that's what we do in terms of conditions or, or a contract. So we can set out those agreed terms. They could be the obligations on each party, what the duties are, what each party is going to do. We set out the price, the payment obligations, when it's going to be paid. We can set out liability issues. We can set out things like, uh, whether or not it's confidential or whether or not we keep certain aspects of things confidential. Um, who owns the intellectual property of anything generated uh, from it? And much more besides. So we can put a lot of information into um, terms and conditions or contracts. Um, so so reiterate, terms and conditions then are a standard form of a contract um, which sets out what terms you are prepared to uh, operate and engage your customers, your suppliers, whoever you're dealing with. Um, so... Why don't you need to worry about them then, right? You don't need to worry about terms and conditions if you're not interested in portraying a professional image. If you don't care about how your business looks and you want to be, uh, you know, Bob the Builder, no disrespect to the building industry, you don't want to come across as professional and don't bother with terms and conditions. Because um, in my view, terms and conditions make, um, make businesses just look that extra bit more professional. You know, you're sending somebody uh, out the quote, the terms and conditions, you're asking them to sign the terms and conditions and return them back to you. It just makes you look a step above your your, your competitors who probably aren't doing it. Um, it just makes you look more professional. It looks like you've pre prepared. It looks like you've done this before. And I think that's really important, that, that image look to start with. Um, second reason why you don't need terms and conditions, if you don't like certainty, so if you're not a fan of having things certain, don't bother with terms and conditions. But if you do like certainty, then have some terms and conditions because terms and conditions help you create the certainty of the agreement. As I said before, it sets down in writing what's, what has been agreed between the two parties. And it means it's completely enforceable and much more enforceable than a verbal agreement between two parties. And much better if it's written down, gives everybody some certainty as to what we've agreed. Third reason, you don't have terms and conditions if you don't like getting paid on time. If you do like getting paid on time, have some terms and conditions because terms and conditions allow you to set payment terms. That could be, for instance, on production of an invoice, 50% upfront, all upfront, stage payments, uh, 60 days, whatever the payment terms, we can put them in a contract, put them in a terms and conditions, and we both know where we're at. And what that means is that then when the, the, the customer doesn't comply, 
you can then start to say, well, hang on a minute, the terms and conditions say that you need to pay this within 30 days, you've not paid, and therefore I can take, uh, take some legal action to force the payment. We can also incorporate terms in there um, about interest and compensation for late payment as well, so that there's some consequences of not making payment on time as well. Fourth reason, four is that number. Uh, fourth reason uh, not to have terms and conditions, if you like having unlimited liability, if you're happy for somebody to sue you and take everything you've got and don't bother with having a contract. If, however, you want to make sure that your house, your family, your livelihood is protected, you want to make sure that if the worst happens and something does go wrong, that you're not sued for every single penny that you've got. And in the terms and conditions, uh, when you're trading with a business to business uh, situation, you can have in there limitation of liability clauses, which limit your liability to what you want. So you could say, I'm not liable for loss of profit, uh, damage to reputation or things like that. Um, and you can limit them, limit your liability to, for example, a specific amount, thousand pounds, 10,000 pounds or million pounds, whatever. Um, or you could limit them to say the aggregate of the invoices uh, raised so that if the worst happens, and sometimes it does, if the worst happens and you're not insured, for, uh, for that loss, that your liability is limited. The fifth reason why you don't need to have terms and conditions if you don't like being legally compliant. Um, if you do want to be legally compliant, think about having some terms and conditions, particularly if you are dealing with a consumer. Uh, consumers have lots of rights and lots of information that's needed to be told to them uh, at the outset of, of having a contract, particularly if you're doing distance selling online or over the phone, um, and particularly things like data protection. GDPR. So, um, so to be legally compliant, particularly with consumers, you need to have things in writing. So do that. Um, and that's it. Five reasons why you don't need to have a terms and conditions, or perhaps why you should think about it. Number six is you've thought, okay, Stephen, you've persuaded me. I will have some terms and conditions. I'll type in terms and conditions on the, the internet. I'll find some free ones online. I'm sure they'll be fine uh, and dandy. And um, and my response to that is this, that you're potentially dealing with tens of thousands of pounds of risk here, and maybe more, it depends on what size business you're doing and what size trade you're doing. Um, and would you risk it for DIY? Whereas if you get somebody that is, um, you know, an authorised, regulated lawyer or um, uh, insured uh, individual that, um, that can provide advice on term conditions, at least you know that if it does go wrong, and something happens and these terms and conditions don't quite work for how you want it, you've got some recourse. You'll also know that, you know, if they've been drafted properly, they're going to fit exactly what you need it for. And I should say, um, in doing some research for this uh, short presentation, most of the terms and conditions that I've seen online as free terms and conditions generators are actually for website terms of use and not trading terms and conditions. Website terms of use, something completely different um, and quite frankly, you know, not, uh, not as essential item as terms and conditions. So that's me. I'm Stephen May, the solicitor, and that is five reasons why you don't need to worry about having terms and conditions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Very useful, very useful guide. Um, whilst I'm sharing your details on the screen of how people can get in touch with you, if you can do that, looks like I'm doing it. Um, if, you, if there was one top tip, given your experience that you would give, for business, for a business, what would that top tip be? Uh, for businesses, read contracts uh, would be that would definitely be my top tip. Um, so here's here's an example. Um, uh, last week, I had a client uh, ring me, new client, not dealt with them before. I've not charged them for this advice either. Um, but they they rang. They they wanted to exit a contract that they signed in March two thousand and fifteen. It has a six month notice period in it. So they gave their six month notice period and the uh, supplier turned around and said, no, the notice period needs to end on the anniversary of the contract, i.e. March. So you've not quite given enough six months this year. So the contract now is going to carry on running until March 2022. So effectively, they've got an 18 month notice period now until um, until the contract can expire. So they come to me and said, that can't be right. Surely, Stephen that's not right. You know, we must be able to get out of it. And I unfortunately have to say to them, no, it's right. In a business to business scenario, you can put pretty much whatever you want into a contract. Um, and if they have a six month notice period and automatic rolling on for 12 month periods thereafter, 
the court will enforce it. There's not much you can do about it. Next time, read the contract or get a lawyer to have a look at it and flag up some of those issues so you know exactly where you're at. So my top tip, read contracts. If you're not sure about it, get a lawyer to have a look at it and explain some of the key issues for you. Sound advice, Stephen. Thanks very much. Your work is done here. Uh, your, your, your ordeal is over. Puts my teeth back in. So uh, thanks for giving up your valuable time today to um, uh, contribute to this uh, session. And um, I'll end the broadcast now. Thank you, Paul.